Isn't that a great song? Every, every hour I need you. You're my one defense. I don't know about you, but I don't need them every hour. I need them every minute. Can we just reduce that even more every second? He sustains. He sustains and, and gives us everything that we need. And maybe you're going through something now and you're saying to God, God, I don't even know if I know you. I don't know if you're here, if you even care, or if you're involved in my life. But I want to say to you, I need you. I'm going through something now that's overwhelming in my life. I've made that confession publicly in front of congregations before, and the Lord just continues to pour out his favor and blessing when I do something like that. And so if you're going through something now and you said, I need a, I need a sense of his presence like never before because I'm going through something too difficult for me to even comprehend, would you raise your hand? And you want that prayer? Amen. Anybody else? Anybody else? Can you see these hands going up? Keep those hands up. Can you just put a hand on the shoulder of the person next to you if you see a hand? Or if you need to get up out of your chair to reach somebody, would you do that? Just put a hand on the shoulder. Thank you, thank you. Let's pray together. Jesus, we love you. We know that we need you every hour. Not just every hour, we need you every minute. Every second of every day, of every week, every month, and every year, we say to you that we need you. Please, oh God. And those watching online might have lifted a hand too. Would you just visit them, visit people right now, sense of your presence, healing touch. Give them a word, a word that would calm them and comfort them and give them assurance that you're there, that you've never forsaken them, that you want a relationship with them, that you're doing things that only you can do. Oh, God, we need you, and we say that we need you. Thank you, Lord. Holy Spirit. Keep moving in this room. Fill us to overflowing. Help us now to hear the word of God, your word, Lord, your message to your people. In Jesus' mighty name, amen? Amen. Let's take our Bibles and go to the book of Nehemiah, chapter 9. Nehemiah, chapter 9. My wife asked me before church, she goes, are you ready to go into the pulpit? Of course, I've been sick a couple of few weeks ago now, and uh, yeah, I said, yeah, I just want to get into the pulpit and preach the word of God. I want to hear from the Lord. I I try to do that every time I, in my study, if you ever want to just swing by my office, you can do that. It's located in this side of the building. It's not in the front, it's in the back. And, uh, and pop by sometime, and that's my refuge. That is a sanctuary for me. I hang out with, with a lot of people in that office through my books, people that have been here years and years ago, people that are still alive, and I don't have conversations with them. I just want you to know that. Um, but I am I'm amongst the giants, some of the greatest women of God and men of God that are on my bookshelves. And then when I put messages together, I, I try to hear a fresh word from the Lord from the text. Uh, I'm not one for repeating messages. I don't go from church to church or from conference to con- or whatever I've spoken at and, and use a message over and over again. I just feel like in my heart, I want to hear God in the moment. I want to have a fresh word from him. And so that happens in my office every week, and I hope and pray that this message is a blessing to you. Well, the R's just keep expanding. I've titled this message, Repenting, Removal, Recounting, and Reputation. How many R's can you find in the book of Nehemiah? That's the goal. (laughs) Nehemiah chapter 9, I want to look at verses 1 down to verse 38. It's the whole chapter. If you want to use the black pew Bible that's in the rack in front of you, that's page 475. I would encourage you to look at the Bible when I'm preaching. If you want to use the Bible app, that's fine, or or, or a hard copy, that's, that's fine too. But it's important for you to take your eyes to the text. It's in the text by the Spirit of God that he's going to speak to us. And so it's important to look at it. It's exciting for me to hear many positive comments about our uh, book study through Nehemiah. Uh, I'm excited about that. Thank you for those who have verbalized that to me in the several weeks and even months that we've been doing this. One of the comments that I've heard is that it's so relevant to our lives, the book of Nehemiah uh, and our situation. So that is a, a very much of an encouragement. The series title is called Reconstruct. The overarching theme of the book of Nehemiah is the reconstruction of the walls of Jerusalem. 
Also, the reconstruction of the economic and cultural foundations of the society that had been destroyed over a century prior. And it's also the reconstructing of the people's spiritual lives, their walk with God, their relationship to God. You'll notice on the screen there is a picture of the Tower of Babel. The Assyrians came in 722, deported the northern tribes of Israel. God used the enemy to then bring chastening to the people of God. They were deported to all of the known nations at that time. And then in 600 B.C., Babylon, or the nation of Babylonia, destroyed and deported Jerusalem and Judah, and that became known as the 70-year Babylonian captivity. While in captivity, the Persians became the world empire, the world rulers over the Babylonians, and so then God would then begin his reconstructing plan through Cyrus, Persian king, and he would use people like Nehemiah and Ezra. Nehemiah is a close confidant of a Persian king named King Artaxerxes. We saw this in chapter 1. And he is given free pass to return back to Jerusalem to reconstruct the walls. Listen to this. God works through the obedience of Nehemiah and Ezra. And God works through the obedience of his people. This is why it's important for you and I to obey the Lord. Because you're going to see him work exponentially in your life as we submit to him and as we obey his word. Would you agree with that? When we don't obey the Lord, the power and the anointing of God will not be on us. The hand of God will not be on a church that disobeys the word of the Lord. And he won't be on your life and my life if we don't obey. So God is at work in a very powerful way through Nehemiah and Ezra because of their obedience. And God still works in this way. Now, we too are in various seasons of reconstructing, and for this morning, I want to focus in our relationship with God, our spiritual reconstruct. It has to do with our title. I said those words earlier as I announced it, repenting, removal, recounting, and reputation. Repentance is part of the reconstruct. It, repentance is realizing that my sin has caused me to have a relationship issue with God, and I need to then turn from that sin, repentance. Removal is those things in our life that we have to separate ourselves from, that we have to walk away from, things that aren't honorable to the Lord, things that we need to just let go of once and for all. And then recounting is looking at God and going, God, you're great. God, you're awesome. Look at what you've done since the first day of my life when I came into this world all the way up to this present time period. Recounting. And then reputation is the reputation of God, but also our reputation. And then how do I live my life in such a way that I make God look good? Reputation. I'm going to show you how that all connects to the text as we work our way through. Now, there are five steps to spiritual reconstruction I want to show you. If you want to write these down in the handout that you might have gotten in your bulletin, then, then do that. I would encourage you to do that. Follow these, and spiritual reconstruction will be a reality in your life. Here's number one. Speak the same things about our sin as God does. you got to say the same thing that God is saying. God, if you're saying that I have sinned, then I have sinned. If we have sinned as a nation, if we've sinned as a people, if we've sinned as a church, then I'm going to say the same thing that God is saying then about us or about me in the area of sin. It's in verse 1, if you'll look at that. Now on the 24th day of this month, the people of Israel were assembled with fasting and in sackcloth and with earth on their heads. You can stop there. Chapter 9 begins with the word now. We know what the word now stands for. It's in chapter 4, 5, and 6 as it begins those chapters. It's a transitional word. It's meant to notify that something is happening. I want to gain your attention. I want you to sit up straight. I want you to look here. It's indi indicative of a change in circumstances or direction of thought, the word now. And so this is used here because there's a transition happening in chapter 9. The Feast of Booths or Tabernacles had been celebrated. We talked about that. There's a picture on the screen here of the a booth, and that what they did is they would construct these things and remind themselves of the wilderness travelings. And so God would say, I want you to construct this. This is going to represent all of the days that I was with you and provided for you during your wilderness experience. The Feast of Tabernacles, or the Feast of Booths. Now, two days later, in the text, the 24th day of this month, 
Two days later, the month is Tishri. Tishri would be known in our understanding as September or October. It says here in the text, and I've read it to you, the people of Israel were assembled. Nehemiah and Ezra then reassemble the people, gather them together. But this time it wasn't to understand that their strength is in the joy of the Lord, or the joy of the Lord is their strength. Now it's them to feel the weight of their sin. Now it's time. Now it's time to mourn. It's time to look at all of the things that the nation of Israel and Judah had done against God. And you need to feel that. You need to feel the weight of that. And so they do that. They gather them together. They knew timing, Ezra and Nehemiah. They knew what the people needed. They knew that they had to assemble the people in this moment. And it says that they had sackcloth, which would have been burlap. We would understand sackcloth as burlap. And they would put that on to signify mourning for their sin. It says that they put earth on them, or they would put dust or dirt. Some versions use that terminology. And that would be signifying mourning. Today, we would probably wear what color to signify mourning? Black. Black. And so this is, this is kind of a cultural thing here, and they're doing that. They, the heaviness of their heart was tremendous and it was becoming more clear to them, the guilt and the confession that was coming out of them in the text, how they had treated and mistreated God. And Ezra knew that the people of God needed to look at their sin and say the same things as God was saying about it. This is how we grow. This is how we grow. Proverbs 28, 13 says, whoever conceals his transgressions will not prosper. If you want to hide it, if you want to put it in a closet, if you want to deny the sin that you have committed, you'll never grow. You'll never be honest with the Lord. You'll never be able to reconstruct your life properly in the spiritual sense. And they knew that. Ezra and Nehemiah knew that. Very important to feel that mourning, that weight. Remember in Genesis 37, verse 34, it's the story of Joseph. Joseph's thrown into a pit. Of course, his brothers are jealous about Joseph, his dreams. And so they want to kill him, but they throw him into a pit. And, uh, and then the Ishmaelites are coming by, and one of his brothers says, hey, how about we don't kill him? How about we pull him out of that, sell him to the Ishmaelites? They're on their way to Egypt. And so they came up with a story that Joseph had been killed, and they put some blood on his coat and sent it to Jacob. And Jacob was distraught. His son, his son whom he loved, was dead. In his mind, and it says that he mourned over Joseph putting sackcloth on Heaviness, Joshua 7, 6, they were defeated, the people of God, by Ai. And it says they tore, Joshua tore his clothes, and then he put dust on his head as a signifying of the mourning for the sin. In the Beatitudes, Jesus preached the message. It's called the Sermon on the Mount. He said, blessed are those who do what? Mourn. Some people say, well, that's because if you're sad, God's going to make you happy. That doesn't mean that in the context. It means you need to mourn for your sin. It means that we need to feel the weight of what we've done. And those people are the ones who are going to be blessed. Those are the ones who are going to grow. Those are the ones who are going to thrive. If you're honest, you should say the same thing about your sin as God says about it. That's what's going on in our text here. Burlap and dirt on the head. Can you picture this scene here as they were experiencing all of this? Now, what's interesting here, too, I want to mention to you is that they chose to assemble outside of a prescribed way. They waited until after the festivals, after the prescribed, uh, maybe we could call it like this, the laws, the laws. Now, this is important, and, I, and I, I hope that this gets through clear. I wanted to explain this. It's important. Leadership has to be flexible. Leadership can't be legal. It can't be about the law. It can't be about, you know, what is best for the system. What is policy? What is procedure? And so what Ezra and Nehemiah do is they read the people. You read the people if you're a shepherd, if you're a leader. And then what you do is you don't emphasize the law. You emphasize liberty. You emphasize freedom. You emphasize those things that lead to health and growth. And so they take what is necessary, the morning, and they move it to another day. Kind of like Jesus in Matthew chapter 12 9 to 24, you remember that Jesus, the religious people, were trying to catch him because he was doing things on the Sabbath. He was healing people on the Sabbath. He was doing spiritual things on the Sabbath. And there was a withered man, had a hand, a withered hand, a man with a withered hand, 
and then they were going to tempt Jesus and see if he would heal on the Sabbath. And, and what does Jesus say? He says, is it, not, is it not good that we do something on the Sabbath? Is it, is it really about the law, or is it about this man being touched by the power of God? And so what he does, he says, come here in front of the Pharisees, in front of the religious people. You come here, man. And he touched his hand and healed him. And it says that the Pharisees conspired to destroy Christ. How can you be that way? Well, religious people are that way. Religious people are that way. They're not spiritual. They're religious. And so if you want to be a spiritual person, know that religious people are going to come after you. It'll be about the law. It'll be about legalism. It'll be that kind of thing that'll be priority, just like the Pharisees were towards Jesus. Well, this is what's happening here. They are very flexible in their leadership. They're watching the people. The people need to see their sin, and they need to say the same thing. Can I ask you that as we move on beyond point number one? Are you saying the same thing to God about your sin? Do you go, yeah, God, you know what? That is sin. I did do that, and I confess that to you, and I feel the weight of that, Lord. I feel badly for that. That's how you get to reconstructing your life spiritually. And they know that. They know it. Here, number two. What do you do? Step number two. Separate ourselves away from the compromises of our past. Anybody know what I'm talking about here, your past life? Verses two down to verse four. Let me read those texts with you. Verse 2, and the Israelites separated themselves, notice it, from all the foreigners and stood and confessed their sins and the iniquities of their fathers. And they stood up in their place and read from the book of the law, the Lord their God, for a quarter of the day. For another quarter of it, they made confession and worshiped the Lord their God for hours. They're, they're hearing the word of God, they're confessing. But what's interesting here is that they separated themselves from all the foreigners. It goes on and talks about, in verse 4, some of the Levites, the spiritual leaders, and there's some names there. Interesting. Interesting. The people of God came out of captivity. Now they're back home in their homeland, in their city, that had been rebuilt, reestablished, reconstructed. But there's something here that they needed to look at, and that is the pagan environment that they were in for such a long time. They had embraced the paganism. They had embraced the culture. The world had gotten inside of them for a long time. Remember, some of these people were born, they were born in Babylon. And so all they know is this worldliness. All they know is this paganism. Did you know that in our own day, paganism is on the rise? There's a resurgence of paganism in thinking and belief. Nothing's new. It just kind of cycles around, doesn't it? It just cycles around. And it's coming to our country in a large measure. Paganism. Well, here's where they're coming from. They're from that pagan environment. The world had gotten inside of them. And they married pagan wives in that process. And so now there's this separation that Nehemiah and Ezra, particularly Ezra, has to bring to their attention. Can I just say this? It says here in verse 2, the Israelites separated themselves from all foreigners. That doesn't mean that if you know somebody that speaks French or from France or from Argentina or from Germany, you separate yourself from them. Oh, I can't be around you. It's not talking like that. That's not what it means when it says foreigner. It says the, the paganism. When, when, you, when you were in Babylonia, Babylon, this is what happened to you. It's like saying for you and I, before we met Christ, we had these compromises. We lived a life that, that wasn't pleasing to the Lord. But do you know that the enemy wants to try to bring those compromises back then into our present life? Have you found that to be true? There needs to be this separation that goes on. But I wanted to clarify that because when it says foreigners, it's not talking about people that, you know, are from South Africa that you need to be away, you know, stay away from, or from Finland, or from, you name it. These things will creep back into our lives and jeopardize the growth and the reconstruct. And this is where he is going with that. It's in the scriptures. I have it on the screen. I just want to cross-reference in Ezra chapter 6. On the 14th day of the first month, the returned exiles kept the Passover for the priests and the Levites had purified themselves together. All of them were clean, so they slaughtered the Passover lamb for all 
the returned exiles, for their fellow priests, and for themselves. It was eaten by the people of Israel who had returned from exile, and also by everyone who had joined and separated themselves, or himself, from the uncleanness of the peoples of the land. You see this? This is important. There's some worldliness. There's some, there's some paganism. There's some thinking. This is talking about belief systems. The way that we think needs to be about the Bible, it, not, not, not where the world's getting it. And there needs to separation. It goes on over in the book of Nehemiah in chapter 10. We'll see that when we get there. The rest of the people, the priests, the Levites, gatekeepers, singers, the temple servants, and all who had separated themselves from the peoples of the lands to the law of God. See, this is what we're doing. We're separating ourselves, those places of compromise, away from that unto God and his word. This is how you grow. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17, Paul said this. You'll see it on the screen. He said it in a New Testament context. Therefore, get, go out from their midst and be separate from them says the Lord, and touch no unclean thing that I will welcome you. This is important to understand. Please follow me on this because um, I, I, don't, I don't want it to be misunderstood here. I'm not talking about fundamentalist separation. Now, if you're from a legalistic background, if you're from a church context, I'm familiar with this background. I, I, I've been in it. I've been around it for a long time. Um, that's not what it's talking about. Some churches will advertise, even on their signs or their literature, we're, we're a separated church. What do they mean by that? They have the King James only, and they usually mark the year. We're fundamentalist, we're independent, and we're separated. That's not what it's talking about. That doesn't mean that everybody has a short haircut if you're a guy, and girls, you have to wear dresses all the time. It doesn't mean fundamentalist separation. That's important to understand. You get trapped in that, but there is a separation that's important. Let me ask you a question. What do we need to separate from? What is it the thinking that you have to separate from? What is it that maybe gripped your heart for a lot of years? You're bitter and you're not forgiving somebody. It could be that kind of thinking that you need to separate yourself from because it's damaging you. Maybe it's an addiction that you've had for a long, long time, and you're like, well, how am I ever going to get past this? There comes a time where we have to look at this, and this is what's happening in this context. Chapter 9 is that Nehemiah and Ezra just bringing it to their attention. You've got to realize that when you married that pagan wife, that, that all of that came in. This is like Ahab and Jezebel. Ahab then marries Jezebel. Wrong decision. Bad decision for Ahab. And then all of that, Ethbaal was her father, and, and Baal and it leads to Babylon and all of the other stuff that you're seeing here. It was a bad decision. It was a compromise. I love this. It says they cried with a loud voice to the Lord their God, to the Lord their God. Their compromises were generational compromises. They were habitual compromises. They were bound by them, and they walked in them. You'll see someone on the screen. He's one of my musical heroes in the Christian realm. His name was Keith Green. Are you familiar with Keith Green at all? You remember him and his, his amazing, amazing uh, lyrics and his songs. He died when he was 28 in a plane crash with 11 other people. Uh, Keith Green, there's a book written by uh, his wife, Melody Green. It's called No Compromise. No compromise. Uh, when I look at people like Keith Green, uh, it motivates me to be careful that the compromises in my life are dealt with. This is a man that was fierce when it came to some of his beliefs. I mean, I mean he was dedicated. This guy was sold out. I mean, he was, he was on fire, you know, for Jesus. Here's some of the things that were said about Keith Green. He offended many. He's off to a good start. I love that. He often especially shocked established religious people. Now, isn't that interesting? Keith Green was a prophet. I think he was a prophet through his music. And the religious people get mad at him. Remember, if you're spiritual, you'll make religious people mad. So if you get religious people coming after you, you're in a good place. Because Jesus had that happen. Right? Right? In his youthful zeal to bring compassion, honesty, and reality back to the church, perhaps the truest practical test of a real prophet is this. 
does he make me uncomfortable? He was blunt, he was funny, he was tactless, and sometimes even crude. He steadfastly refused to accept the spiritual status quo. He quietly mocked hypocrisy with laughter while he laid bare his own struggles and fears with tears. He impacted his generation like a spiritual H-bomb, and the reverberations of his life, courage, and commitment will still be felt for generations to come. He loved Jesus. No compromise. What are those compromises in our life? Number three, share in what God has done. Verse five down to verse 23, share in what God has done. The majority of the chapter is really given to Ezra sharing the faithfulness of God towards his people. God's ongoing promise and covenant-keeping commitment to the people of God since the very beginning. This is to instill into them a strong sense of remembrance of all that God has done for them. Verse 5, said, watch this, the Levites said, verse 5, stand up and bless the Lord your God from everlasting to everlasting. Blessed be your glorious name, which is exalted above all blessing and praise. Oh, it's important to remember the greatness of God. It's important to remember the goodness of God. They know that. So in verse 6, notice it, you have made heaven. Notice he goes way back to the beginning, to the creation, Genesis 1 and 2. You have made heaven, the heaven of heavens with all their hosts, the earth and all that is on it, the seas and all that is in them, and you preserve all of them. This is an amazing beginning to helping them to realize, to share in all that God has done. This is how you get stronger spiritually. This is how it happens. They know it. He's a good leader, Ezra. He's a great pastor, great priest. It's important to mention all these things. How was God involved since the very beginning of their life? There's a theological term called preservation of the saints. Some would call it the perseverance of the saints if you're from a Reformed tradition, which I land in that camp. I believe that when God saves someone, that person is ultimately going to persevere all the way to heaven. There's nothing that can ever stop that. Not even the mistake that you made last week or the sin that you committed last month. You're ultimately going to be preserved by God. That's another way of saying the perseverance of the saints. This is God's active involvement in our life since the very beginning. When your name was written in the Lamb's Book of Life from before the eternity passed, all the way to glory, that's God keeping you, securing you, taking care of you, providing for you, speaking to you, holding you, loving on you, All of it, you're going to persevere. You're going to make it. You're going to make it. The preservation, he preserves. Well, he preserves the people of God. This is what Ezra is saying. And it started right from creation. This is God that has done this. This is incredible. Then he moves over to the Abrahamic covenant. If you look at verse 7, look at verse 7. He goes on, you are the Lord Uh, the God who chose Abram and brought him out of Ur of the Chaldeans and gave him the name Abraham. And you found his heart faithful before you and made with him a covenant to give to his offspring. This is amazing. The Abrahamic covenant, the promises of God, the obedience of Abraham. Think about that. Remember, God is at work through our obedience. You obey him. God moves. God anoints. He puts his hand on your life. You obey him. Abraham obeyed. He went up to Mount Moriah with his son, and he was going to sacrifice his son. And then all of a sudden, there was a ram in the thicket. Right? Remember that story? Are you still with me? Important. So Ezra goes back to that. Creation, Abrahamic covenant. Very important. Then, verses 9 down to verse 21, Ezra takes them back to the Mosaic covenant. Can you look at verse 9? And you saw the affliction of our fathers in Egypt and heard their cry at the Red Sea. And perform signs and wonders against Pharaoh and all his servants and all the people of his land. For you knew that they acted arrogantly against our fathers. And you made a name for yourself as it is to this day. God made a name for himself. That's reputation. That's reputation. 41 years, or 40 years, it says in verse 21, you sustained them in the wilderness and they lacked nothing. The land was promised to the people of God it was given. Now they're occupying it. Brand new wall, brand new economy, houses are built. Everything is coming together. Their spiritual life is being really confronted by Ezra the priest. Very important. 
How do you reconstruct spiritually? Share in what God has done. Share in it. Remind yourself. Let it go into your, your, your thinking. Dwell on it. Meditate on it. Take your Bibles and go, go back and just look at how this has unfolded. Go back in your life when you first got born again and then reflect on how Jesus has been faithful to you, how he's touched you, how he's done things that only he could possibly do in your life. This is how it happens. It's just so brilliant for Ezra to lead them this way. Can I just say to you, share in the providence of the Lord, meaning the steps that the Lord has given to you. He's ordained your steps. If you go back to providence and go, wow, God, every step that I've ever taken, you have been there. You have led me and, and did incredible things. It says their clothes did not wear out and their feet did not swell. Isn't that great? Everybody struggles. You've got swollen feet. You've got some edema or something going on. You're thinking, oh, why are my feet swollen? Usually what that is is indicative of, of something going on in your body that's not healthy. Right? Their feet didn't even swell from all of what they were going through in the wilderness. I mean, God was there. God was there from the very beginning. So we speak or say the same things about our sin. We separate from those compromises that would come back into our life. And then we share in the greatness, the goodness, and the faithfulness of God. Number four, number four, subdue all those places the enemy wants to reestablish in our lives. Verses 24 down to verse 37. The devil wants you to go back to Egypt. You're saying, I have never been to Egypt. What are you talking about, Chris? I'm talking figuratively. In Exodus 16, you see the people of God going through the wilderness, and they get there, and then all of a sudden they start complaining. They start saying to Moses, Moses, have you brought us out here to kill us? They start turning on Moses and Joshua. Aaron, turning on them, complaining and criticizing. Oh, they had forgotten God. They had forgotten how God was moving in their midst, what he had done. So Ezra knows that the people here need to be reminded of this, and they also need to understand that you need to subdue some stuff. You need to bring it under control. But the devil wants you to go back to Egypt. Can I just say, Egypt is not where you need to live. You don't need to go back. God has brought you this far. You keep going with him. Amen? You keep going. Enemies go, oh, just go back to the way you used to live. Go back to the way you used to think. Go back to the kind of things you used to do. No! You don't do that. The tempter will come to you and speak to you, and you say, no! I'm new in Christ. I'm born again by the Spirit of God. The Lord is involved in my life like never before. Don't listen to the lies of the enemy. Oh, go back to Egypt. It'll be easier. Can I just say to you, I've seen people go back to Egypt. Through the years of ministry, I've seen them go back to Egypt, and they do not do well. They never do well. You will not do well going back to Egypt. Hear that warning. I love you, care about you. You are not meant to live like a slave and in bondage. You're meant to live free. So live free. It's amazing commentary from verses 27 down to verse 37. We won't read all of those verses. Oh, have you ever had victory in your life then the next day it was defeat? Anybody with me? Don't leave me hanging up here by myself. I mean, you can have like a moment with God, and then the next day it's a moment with the devil. You could be doing something so well in your life, Christian-wise, and then all of a sudden you feel like you've just lost your salvation, which you can't. We just talked about that earlier. Perseverance of the saints. I remember I, I loved baseball. Any baseball fans here? I grew up uh, following the Philadelphia Phillies. Is that a good thing in this? Church, is that okay? I'm not going to get stoned or anything. I do like the Red Sox, by the way. I've been in New England 30 years, so you consider me a New England. But back in the day, I followed the Philadelphia Phillies, and Larry Bowe was the shortstop. I loved Larry Bowe. Now, I did pretty good at baseball. I, I, I was okay. And I had made it on this team that was, it was, it was a pretty prestigious team. I couldn't believe I made it. And they put me at shortstop. And I'm thinking Larry Bowe all the way. I mean, I was just loving the Philadelphia Phillies. And I wanted to be like Larry Bowe. Anyway, I'm at shortstop, and there was a, a guy on first base, and I got in position, right, to get that ball if it's hit to me. And sure enough, it was hit to me. Now, if there's a person on first base, what is the shortstop thinking? Does anybody know? Yeah, you're going to second base to stop the runner. Maybe even turn a double play, right? 
So I get ready, and I'm, I'm just like, this is going to be awesome. And, and I'm ready, and the ball's hit to me. It's hit going up to the middle of the field, so it's going to make it into outfield. So I dive like Larry Boa. I mean, I'm like airbound. I get like three feet off the air, and I land, and I catch it. And I flip it over to the second baseman, and we get the runner out. I'm telling you, the crowd went crazy. They're standing to their feet yelling, Larry Boa, Larry Boa. I couldn't believe it. I'm like, that was awesome. How did I do that? The very next play. Ball's hit to me again. And I'm like, this is going to be awesome for a second time. And I take that ball and I throw it to the first base to get the runner. And it goes 15 feet over the first baseman's head into the stands. Why do I share that? Because you can have a victory moment in your life. And the very next day, you can fail miserably. It happens. It happens to all of us. Subdue, it's on the screen. Here's what it means. It means lacking in intensity and strength. And there's some things in your life you're going to have to subdue. You're going to have to kind of steer, you're going to have to try to uh, take the intensity out of it. You're going to have to try to take the strength out of it. It's important. There's parts of our past that we'll be tempted to go back into. And, and Ezra knew that. And we think that we can live in that again. It's a deception. It's a deception. Oh, they're experiencing such great things here in our text. So much is going on in the people of God in their new city, their new walls, their new economy, their new life spiritually. But look out for those things that will try to come back into your world. So Ezra puts them in remembrance of God, his workings, their sin, the rebellion that was going on for over a century. But there's those things you're going to have to subdue. What is it in your life? Number five, seal your new commitment to the Lord going forward. Verse 38, we'll jump right to the end. Notice verse 38. Because of all of this, we make a firm covenant in writing. On the sealed document are the names of our princes, Levites, and our priests. What a commitment is being sealed here. Very important. Because of all of this, all of the things that Ezra had reflected with them on since creation, the Abrahamic covenant, the Mosaic covenant, how God was so faithful to them, so good to them, we're going to make a commitment. We're going forward. We're going to be faithful again. We're going to be obedient to God again. We see that he has promised these things. We're going to keep our promises back to God. It's a ceiling. They were recounting the goodness of God, but also on their own obedience. Would they still follow? Would they stay loyal? Would they be serious about their new life with God in Jerusalem and Judah? Nehemiah and Ezra know what commitment looks like and how important it is to reconstruct Jerusalem and Judah and how to reconstruct our own lives. Some people maybe in this room need to recommit. Seal your commitment going forward once again, whatever it may be. You, you deal with that with the Lord. Can I ask you this, and I'll bring it to a conclusion. Here are the steps to spiritual reconstruction. Which step are you on? Are you saying the same things as God about your sin? Are you separating yourself from those things? Maybe even a person that's toxic in your world, you need to separate from them. For a season, maybe God will have you do that. Sharing in the things of God, are you subduing some of those things the enemy would want to try to bring back into your life? And are you sealing? The, what step are you on? What step? Let me illustrate this by going to uh, Maui with you. I, we were in Maui some years ago, and we wanted to go to the top of uh, a volcano, Haleakala. And I do have a picture there I want you to see. Um, this is a little bit different from when I was there, you can see the elevation is 10,000 feet. So that's 4,000 feet higher than where that we're familiar with. Mount Washington, 6,000, right? So uh, at least I drive to the top of uh, Haleakala, and then we get out of the car, and as I approach the staircase, there's a sign that says, uh, warning, your, the elevation is 10,000, know, whatever it is. And I looked at that sign, and I said, yeah, that doesn't apply to me. And so what I did is I started running up the stairs. I started taking two at a time. 
And then when I got to the top, I felt like Fred Sanford in Sanford and Son. I'm like, here I come. I was seriously having that moment. I'm like, because the elevation is so high, I didn't take that into consideration. I just said, I can take these steps. I don't need to evaluate anything. I was so prideful. Can I just say that? I was so prideful, so arrogant. After I caught my breath, I, was, I said, Lisa, that was scary. That was scary. What steps are you on? You see, what I should have done is I should have discerned. I should have been more aware of what was going on. I should have looked at the sign, and I, you know, it said, warning. Remember that you're at 10,000 plus square, or, um, elevation feet. And so I didn't do that. I didn't do that. I wonder how we're doing spiritually when it comes to that. Are, are we humbling ourselves enough to go, you know, what, what step am I on? Am I even on the steps at all? Where am I? Please look at this. I think there's similarities to this illustration. To reach the kind of reconstruct, we must start, listen here, at the gospel. This is where you begin. You're never going to be able to climb the stairs and get the view of God and the greatness of God. That was a great view, by the way, top of Haleakala. But you're never going to be able to get there if you don't start with Jesus as your Savior. That's where you start. You start with conversion. You start with Jesus. Are you born again? Are you born again? Uh, I got born again at 19, and I had to go through these steps. I had to repent, and I had to go to Jesus and say, you're the Savior, not me. Uh, you're the one that died on that cross for me. Uh, and then I was confessing. I was like, Jesus, I need you. Uh, I've had this life before you, and I don't want that life anymore. I want a new life. And would you come into my life and be my Savior? I, I put my trust in you. This is what happened to me at 19. Has it happened to you? Maybe it hasn't for someone. You're not going to be able to climb the steps. I mean, that would be irrelevant if you don't start at the gospel. And so it's Jesus and him crucified and risen from the dead. So let me finish with some direct questions. Are you saying the same thing about your sin as God? Are you separating from some stuff that uh, you know are not contributing to your growth? Are you sharing in all the goodness of God and the faithfulness of God? Are you subduing those things? Look out, the enemy wants to try to bring you back in compromises and different things like that. And are you sealing your commitment moving forward? See, this is all about repenting. It's all about removal. See how this kind of ties into the title and recounting all that God has done and, of course, the reputation. It's amazing to see how many people are under spiritual reconstruct in our church. Amazing. Now, my wife and I talk about this often. We love you so much and want the best for you not just physically, mentally, emotionally, and relationally, but spiritually. And when we look around this church, we see so many people going through a reconstruct. That's not meant to offend anybody. Well, I've always been pretty good spiritually. I don't know about you, but I've never been always really good spiritually. So if you've been really good all of your Christian life and you have no room for reconstructing, then you're farther down the road than I am. So it's not meant to offend anybody. It's just meant to go, hey, you know what? This is cool. I see God moving a fresh work in your life and reconstructing some thinking or some behavior or something like that. It's a good thing. There are some in our church that you're stuck. You haven't entered onto the first step. Not that you're not saved. You're saved, but you're stuck. You ever heard of altitude sickness? Anybody? That was what I was on the verge of on Haleakala. Some people have attitude sickness. In the church, here, this church. Attitude sickness. Do you know COVID is still going around? Do you know somebody got COVID recently? It's still going around. I don't know if it's the form that was four years ago, but there's, they call it COVID. I call it COVID too. I call it COVID of criticism and cynicism. There's some people that have COVID. You're not going to grow. It's not going to happen. You won't reconstruct as long as you have attitude sickness. And you have COVID of criticism. Love you. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for your word. Nehemiah is such an amazing man. Ezra as well. Oh God, we pray that you would help us to reconstruct our life spiritually. If there's places that we've looked at, that uh, steps, whatever step we are on, maybe we haven't entered the first one. 
because they're not born again. We're not born again. We don't know Jesus personally. May that happen today. If we are on the steps, maybe it's only a couple up the way. Maybe we tried to run them all, and it's all pride like it was in my heart, Lord. May there be no pride. Humility. Please, please help us to be a humble people. You wanted the people of God, your people, in Jerusalem, in Judah, to realize all of the things that you had done for them. And so, God, help us to keep realizing this, remembering, recounting. So much in this chapter, Lord, I pray that it got through some of it. Maybe not all of it, but a, a thought or a truth here and there. And so, Lord, as we go to the table of God, the communion table, maybe some of this decision-making will happen then. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Come on up here, James, and lead us to the communion table.